What's cooking, everybody? It's Monday, July 27th. Summer is about halfway over, and this is the Poor Couples Food Guide Deep Dish Podcast, where we do a deep dive on all your favorite foods. I'm your host, Poor Couples Food Guide Eric, aka The Goose, aka Buggy. And with me, as always, is my delightful co host, Poor Couples Food Guide Meg, aka Le Skunk, aka Megane. Hello. And together, we are your food research team extraordinaires. We hope you're hungry for some tasty knowledge facts and possibly a little horny because this episode's got quite a bit of sexual innuendo in it. Anyway, your main course today will be some nice, jiggly, bouncy flan. Alrighty. Let's dig into this week's appetizers. What do we got this week? Well, for starters, we got Friday food. Friday food's going to be some refreshing summertime curry. That's actually a recipe we got from Cooking with Dog, which is a YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with it, it does not actually have to do with cooking the animal, the dog. It's actually the opposite. It's cooking with an adorable poodle named Francis and his chef's sidekick, who is just known as Chef. She's a middle-aged Japanese lady, and the two of them are adorable. Actually, I say should say were adorable, because... Francis unfortunately passed away a year or two ago, I think. Now he's replaced with a stuffed poodle toy, which is cute. But then also, sometimes they make the picture of him on Chef's apron talk, and it's a little, like, disconcerting. Yeah, it's not the best. Like I said, they should have just had, like, a little cartoon version of him talking on the screen, but, eh. Somewhere, someone out there was like, hey... I can make the little picture on your apron talk. Wouldn't that be cool? And they were like, I I guess so. Poor grieving woman was just like, fine, do whatever you want. (laughs) Yeah, part of me wonders if they made that YouTube channel tongue in cheek because, you know, unfortunately, the dopey stereotype that persisted over the last like century or so is that Asian people cook dogs. Actually, that's not a stereotype. In China, they do fucking eat dogs. So, I think but, it's one of the Koreas, too. Yeah, there's like the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. It's kind of bullshit, but um, let's not get into that. Point here is that Cooking with Dogs, a Japanese YouTube channel, as far as I know, they don't have much of a history of cooking man's best friend, fortunately. So, funny story, though, was when we were talking to our friend Kelly once, I brought up cooking chopsticks they're like big big chopsticks you use like actually in like pots and stuff so i was bringing up to you that i saw them in the uh in some video by cooking with dog so it came out as oh you know what i learned from cooking with dog the other day (laughs) and yeah kelly was not in the loop on that one so she was a little horrified until we explained oh well so yeah like i said uh, i don't know maybe they did it tongue-in-cheek but Japan's wacky, so as we'll go into further on in this podcast, we've got some fun things in store for all you Japanophiles. We weren't going to talk about how hot it is, but just just in case anybody cares, New York's it's still hot. Yeah, New York still got its heat wave going on. It was almost a hundred today, but luckily it wasn't humid, so yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't that bad. wasn't so bad. I guess I don't know. It's that old stereo or that old saying of "Oh, it's a dry heat." It wasn't exactly a dry heat though, because it was still like sixty-five percent humidity. Yeah, it's still Long Island. But compared to oh, yesterday when it was like eighty-seven percent humidity, then hmm, I'll take sixty-five percent humidity. That's not bad. Breathing made me sweat yesterday. Yeah, that was bad. We we had a party yesterday, and uh, to accommodate social distancing and to make sure everybody was safe, we all just sat poolside. Yeah, and couldn't go in the air conditioning. Thoroughly sweat our asses off and melted into puddles, but it was still it was a good time. We got some yummy food, but I think that should wrap it up for appetizers this week. So, without further ado, I present to you today's main course. Flan, also known as creme caramel, also known as quesillo, caramel custard, flado, caramel crema, crema volteada, and even simply pudding in some Asian dialects. It goes by many, many names, but no matter what you call it, it is one of the finest simple pleasures in the dessert kingdom. I feel like flan is one of those foods that even if you've never had it, you probably like recognize it and know what it is, or at the very least, you know what it looks like. Although I guess come to think of it, I bet you that the, the common masses don't really know what it is per se, like what it's made of, how you make it. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a few people in like the Midwest maybe who weren't really familiar with it at all. It's just, you know, 
It's fun. It's it's that weird jiggly blob thing all those Hispanic people like to eat there, don't you know? I don't know. I shouldn't stereotype, though. Maybe people in the Midwest do know about flan. I'll have to ask my friend Patrick. He's, uh, he's born and raised in Texas, and he does a mean Hank Hill impersonation. Seriously, though, let's give an overview here. For the uninitiated, flan is a type of baked custard served with caramel sauce on top of it. Custards are actually a really wide open subset of food stuffs that come in all sorts of flavors and varieties and preparation styles. Flan is one of those. Flan is a custard. And also at the same time, pudding is a type of custard. But then also creme brulee is a custard. Pastry cream is a custard. And then also curveball time, quiche is a type of custard too. They're all different, but they all fall under the, the custard blanket, so to speak. The goo you dip French toast into is also a custard before cooking. It seems like there's a common trait that custards equal delicious. Makes sense. Even though they're all different, almost all custards just start with a base of eggs and milk. So eggs and milk, that's a winning combination. Older recipes sometimes use other ingredients in place of the dairy. So at a very basic layer, custard just has to start with eggs, I believe. Today, though, in modern day, yeah, they basically just start with eggs and milk, and after that, the sky is the friggin' limit. Generally, though, dessert custards like flan, they seem to be a bit more prominent in today's cooking world. The egg and milk base usually has sugar and other flavorings added into it to make it all yummy, and it makes sense because dairy goes pretty friggin' great with sugar and chalk and all that good sweet stuff. That said, though, as mentioned, quiche is a custard. And that gets onions and cheese and spinach and stuff. So, yeah, there's plenty of savory custards as well that are just as delicious. Yeah, I know, I know. It sounds confusing, but, like, let's think of it this way. Custard is basically, like, a food family, and there's a bunch of subspecies of custard, but they're all part of the same family. Although, come to think of it, there's also just a dish called custard, I think, which is, like, a sweet, thick, eggy pudding... Let's just ignore that for now because we don't have time to go through that. Anyway, we went way off course here. Let's just say that was your crash course in custard. So, like like we said, flan is a type of baked custard. So now that you're a custard expert, you probably guess it. Flan is mostly just eggs, milk, and sugar, plus maybe a few other ingredients. It's usually served in single-serving portions as a, as a little squishy, jiggly little mound with sweet caramel sauce on top of it. That caramel sauce really lends to what makes flan look so distinct and unique. It has a really cool two-tone appearance, where the flan as a whole is a cream color or light yellow, with this nice brown, dark brown on top. That said, flan can also be served as larger desserts in a casserole dish and sliced up to hang out like a cake. Yeah, the flavor is pretty much what you expect, too. It's, it's sweet and it's creamy. It tastes kind of like pudding. But the addition of caramel sauce on top, it gives like a dark edge, so it's not just this bland blob. It's not necessarily salted caramel either, just a nice dark brown sugar flavor. I think it's worth noting, it's called the caramel sauce, but it's an interesting translucent sauce. It's not creamy like a Werther's caramel or a chewy candy or something. It's not even like the caramel sauce you get on like ice cream sundaes. It's honestly mostly just made of melted brown sugar. It's kind of hard to describe if you've never had it before. Yeah, it is tasty, though. Like, it almost has, like, a burnt quality to it, but... So it's not just like caramel. I, I, I really like the, the caramel sauce that goes on it. As far as the texture for flan, it kind of falls somewhere between, like, a, a nice eggy quiche and, well, anime boobs, basically. I don't know how better to describe it. It just... If you've ever seen anime, for if for some reason you're like 100 years old, anime is Japanese cartoons, you know it's not uncommon to have some, well, chesty, well-endowed characters on screen. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, but Japanese animators just don't quite seem to understand how the female figure or human physiology works. Or gravity. Yeah, or gravity. So they just, they, they frequently draw girl characters with these cartoonish big old bazonga titties that just bounce around like they're in zero gravity and the laws of physics don't apply to them anymore. Eh, I don't know. Anytime I see that, it just, it, it makes me think of flan. Since flan tends to jingle and bounce around the same way, it's, I don't know. If thinking about boobs and thinking about flans has this connection, that just makes me a pervert. It's a sign of some sort of underlying childhood brain injury I don't know about. 
I don't know, if hell, if that's wrong, I don't want to be right. But actually with that, I think we've covered it pretty well. It's, well, it's a jiggly boob dessert covered in burnt sugar and it's related to quiches. I think you've uh, you really sold it to everyone now. Yeah, that's not too confusing, right? Well, all right, maybe if we take a look at the origins of flan, we'll, we'll get a better idea of it. Though, uh, not to give spoilers, honestly, I, I don't think it's going to help. You're about to find out why, though, so let's take a look at the origins of flan. So the earliest version of flan goes pretty far back. And by pretty far back, I mean it might have actually existed around the same time as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, that's a long time ago. 2,000 years? Yeah, like, if you said that, if you were like, Jesus Christ, back then, when the earliest flans were around, like, there's a chance he could have just, like, answered and been like, hey, want to go get some flan? <laughs> Hell yeah, dude, that's, uh, that's a new, like, interdimensional life goal. I want to have flan with Jesus someday. Now, hang on. All right. Back then, to be fair, they weren't just like slinging out these perfect, delicious caramel boob flans that we know today. Nah, back then, it wasn't uncommon for them to contain things like fruits and wine and spices and, uh, for fuck's sake, fish sauce? Yeah, all right, yep, this is, a, this is, we found an honest to God recipe based on documentation and research from this writer, Sally Grainer. She published some cookbook that replicates all these old-timey ancient Roman Empire recipes. And, uh, yeah, this recipe for old ancient flan calls for eggs, wine, pears. Okay, we're off to a good start. Cumin and black pepper. Not, 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 not crazy about that. Raisin wine, olive oil, and some good old fucking fish sauce. Mmm, nothing quite says dessert like the overpowering flavor and aroma of a nice, damp, musky crotch. Also, I gotta point out, I like how unabashedly Italian this recipe sounds, fish sauce aside. Like, you got these Romans that were early Italians, they're making a custard, so, you know, naturally they decide you gotta throw in some red wine and, you know, and olive oil too. Honestly, if tomatoes were back then, or around back then, I wouldn't be surprised if they threw a few of those in too, just, you know, just for shits and giggles. My question is, if wine is made from grapes, and raisins are also made from grapes, what the hell is raisin wine? Is it like <laughs> super wine or something? Is it grapes squared? Uh, joking aside, though, the, the Romans were actually the first civilization on Earth to domesticate chickens and raise them for egg production, so makes sense. Even though their early custard recipes kind of sound like the result of a, a Mad Libs puzzle, it, it does make a lot of sense that they were the ones who originally discovered you could bake eggs into a custard. Why can I not stop picturing chickens walking around in little togas now? Also, can we make little togas for your parents' chickens? Hey, if you could crochet those, then go for it. Anyway, as mentioned, these early versions of flan custards were a bit different. They were a little bit closer to quiche probably since they featured a lot of like spicy ingredients and, and they were flavored with stuff like meats or, or, or fish sauce. You know, uh, these predecessors to modern custard were, were known as flado, which translated from Latin as flat cake. Interestingly, this word was later modified into the present day flan. So yeah. The Romans really just paved the entire foundation for this dessert. Fortunately, though, at some point, someone finally stood up and said, Hey, uh, hey, what, what, what if you take those nice, smooth, like, creamy egg cakes that we're making and, like, you know, stop adding in all that disgusting shit like fermented fish and, and goat brains and olive oil? Thank God. At some point during the Roman Empire, people began preparing it with honey to make it into more of a dessert instead of whatever the fuck that last recipe was. Unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end, and eventually the Roman Empire fell. But thank God that these early custard recipes survived because, well, they are, they spread to Europe, and that's what led them to develop into the, the little delightful jiggly boob desserts that we know and love today. Well, now that we've spent some time in early civilization, I think we can move forward a bit. So let's get nitty and let's get gritty, because now we're going into the history and development of modern flan. <music> So there's no documentation that really pinpoints when the sweet custards of the Roman Empire were invented, but it became a popular enough dish by the time that the empire dissolved. And like other aspects of Roman culture, these early flan recipes survived on in places like Spain and Italy and the UK and other parts of Europe. 
Which brings us to this week's dumb shit British English of the week. So, I know flan goes by a lot of different names. We established that earlier. But by far, flan is the most popular version across most of the world. But of fucking course, England's got to be all cute and complicated. No, rather in the UK, a flan is a large custard pie similar to a quiche or a tart that features a rimmed crust. And uh, I guess it's got like smooth custard cream in the middle so that actually counts as a custard. I guess they then refer to flan as like creme caramel, that kind of name. Fuck that. That's a mouthful. Part of what's great about flan is that it's a simple dish. Simple dishes need simple names. Flan. One syllable. Easy to say. It's perfect. Calling it creme caramel is too friggin' pretentious. It's a dessert that you can order for like three bucks after eating a plate of chimichangas, or hell, you can just buy them up like by opening a plastic carton from the refrigerator. It doesn't need a hoity-toity name like creme caramel. So stupid. Sorry, Britain. We love you. We really do. But you speak the stupidest version of English on the planet. (laughs) Anyway, in researching this, we also did find one source that cites a 15th century Italian document which suggested that cooks were trying to promote custards and flan as a health food that helped people with liver and kidney disorders, since apparently eggs were believed to be like really healthy of a food at the time. Also, it's somehow asserted that eggs were supposed to be good for fertility, which, to be fair, I suppose that was a bigger deal back then when you probably had a better chance of being struck by lightning than, you know, living to the age of 40. Uh, I don't get this one. I I guess they just kind of assumed, like, yeah, chickens hatch from the eggs, and that means if you eat the eggs, you'll get the super fertile powers. The, The baby chickens, they hatch in your stomach, and they lay more eggs inside, and those turn into human babies later on when the man and the woman have the intercourse, and then one year later, magically, the lady poops out all the babies, and bam, the circle of life is complete. Sure. Spain, in particular, really took a liking to these pre flans and began to move it more towards the modern versions of what we have today. During the medieval era, Spanish bakers began making flan with the simple eggs milk sugar formula that we still use today. They were also the ones to add the brown sugar sauce, further transforming it to present day flan. Yeah, supposedly early variants of caramel were invented in the Middle East around the year 1000 AD, when cooks discovered the concept of browning and crystallizing sugar. So at some point, there was Arabian occupation Spain in like the medieval era. Well, they must have brought over that culinary concept over to Europe. At this point, honestly, there wasn't much left for them to develop. Flan is a really simple dish, and by the 1500s, Spain had combined caramel sauce with the plain custards they already had been working on, and they already had something pretty similar to what we have now. Shit. Do we just like wrap the episode early now? Nah, nah, of course not. The story ain't over yet. There's still a little bit of a history involved. Uh, For starters, this food timeline is still stuck in Europe, but today I feel like the dish is more strongly tied to Latino countries like South America. So how did it end up over there, making all the way from Spain to South America? Oh, right, the conquistadors. Forgot about that whole conquering Mexico deal. (sighs) Okay, so in 1521, Herman Cortes, one of the most prominent Spanish explorers, led a campaign to defeat and conquer the Aztec Empire, effectively giving control of Mexico to Spain. This is, in case you haven't realized, this is really, really oversimplifying things here. The Spanish conquest of South America lasted several centuries, and it was probably one of the, uh, it was a huge turning point that permanently shaped the future of world history. It was a period of several hundred years where countless indigenous peoples of South and Central America were fucking annihilated by European settlers. Entire civilizations vanished, cultures were lost to time, but it ain't all bad news, because the Spanish did introduce the new world to the glorious dessert known as flan. That and, you know, smallpox. Seriously, though, for better or worse, mostly worse, Spanish colonization injected a lot of European culture into South America. Notably, a lot of their foods made their way over, and flan specifically became very, very popular in the New World very quickly. Well, at least there's some good news. Yeah, Mexico in particular was responsible for creating a lot of the more modern varieties of flan that we see today, like coconut and tres leches and even chocolate flan. 
What started off as this international dish from their oppressors eventually was adopted to one of their own favorite desserts. So, not exactly a bad trade, right? I know, I know, I know. The Spanish raped and pillaged their land, killed off entire tribes, and generally fucked them over for centuries. But on the other hand, coconut milk at Flan is pretty, pretty good. It, was, it wasn't all bad, right? Right? At this point, though, we were approaching the 20th century, and flan was now a mainstay dessert in Europe, South America, and North America, so basically like two-thirds of the world. And over the last century or so, it spread to the rest of the world. So I mean, hey, totally fair. It survived multiple conquests and empires collapsing. It's been around for thousands of years. I think those jiggly little egg boobs earned it. Well, with that, I guess it's time to get modern and talk about the most recent era of flanitude. Or flanification? Flanning? Flanness. So as we mentioned, flan spread all over the fucking place in the last century or so. Like, almost every single friggin' country on the planet eats it now, and, and oftentimes they all have their own little nuances with the dish. Like, for example, flan is actually surprisingly big in India, especially in areas that used to house, like, Portuguese colonies that brought it over. Big surprise there. But yeah, apparently it's popular to serve it with masala chai or even to make chai spice-flavored custards. Fuck, that sounds good. Masala chai flan. We yeah, gotta try that. that does sound really good. Over in Puerto Rico, they actually make a Thanksgiving flan. They actually add pumpkin puree and spices to give it an autumnal like makeover and serve it as a traditional dessert on Thanksgiving. Damn it, that one also sounds really good. I don't know how much longer we can keep this up. I want to try making Thanksgiving flan this year. Let's do that. All right. Next up, Japan, as we mentioned, is weirdly obsessed with flan, like more so than a lot of other countries. Like you can buy prepackaged flan at just, just about any konbini or convenience store, as they call them there. We'll talk a little bit more about this later on, though, because frankly, their fascination with it is kind of random, considering how Asian countries don't tend to be the biggest fans of dairy, but we'll get to that later on. Speaking of which, Malaysia is another country in the east that enjoys a good flan every now and then. Apparently it's sold a lot around Ramadan as a popular snack for breaking your fast. Good choice. If I had to fast and stop eating food, flan would be a good, quick, easy little dessert to have afterwards. Good call, Malaysia. Respect. Also, as we mentioned, many South American countries like Chile, Peru, Brazil, Argentina, and others... Flan there comes in a wide variety of flavors like coffee and chocolate and coconut. They frequently serve it alongside dulce de leche, which is basically just like turbo super caramel pudding. Oh, man. In Cuba, they take it a step further and they serve it with motherfucking ice cream. Damn, these Latinos know how to do dessert right. Are we done recording yet? I want to go get some flan now. Soon, soon. We'll get flan soon. And of course, we here in America use flan as a means to brainwash people with hypnotic commercials, especially in the rural Midwest. Er, no, wait, I think that was an episode of Curds the Cowardly Dog. Man, that's a hell of a deep cut if anyone actually recognizes it. Either way, this list goes on and on and on and on. Like we said, flan is a really, really overlooked dish in terms of just international popularity. But unfortunately, as with other popular foods, you do sort of get some of the more McDonaldized versions of it. They have like pre-made mixes that you can, you know, just throw some water in and put it in a mold, put it in the fridge, and you get flan like 30 minutes later. But, you know, even though it's convenient, it's, it's kind of shitty. It's not the best. Most of those mixes don't even actually contain eggs or egg solids or egg powder or whatever. It's which is stupid because... Flan not having eggs in it, it's like a milkshake not containing milk. It's one of the essential fucking building blocks, come on! Instead, many instant flan mixes use thickeners like agar agar powder, which give it this supple but firm consistency. Remember, just cause it bounces, it doesn't mean it's real. Are you talking about anime boobs again, or flan still? I, I, I don't even know anymore. Anyway, yeah, agar agar is a kind of gelling agent that's extracted from red algae of all places. It was discovered in Japan, which makes perfect sense. Japan loves jiggly things, and Japan loves oceany things. So an oceany thing that makes jiggly things? 
さあ、本当にすごいですね。Some of these instant flans also use carrageenan, which is another type of thickener, which is derived from, oh, derived from red algae again. What the fuck is with algae being used in all these weird thickening agents? I mean, I guess it makes sense. Algae is basically just like weird plant slime that grows on the side of rocks, but like, who the fuck had the bright idea to boil it up and make food out of it? Like, oh man, this yogurt is pretty good. You know what would make it even better? We thickened it up with some more slimy ass juice made of that red stuff that grows on the side of rocks at low tide. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Well, either way, these powder mixes are widely available, so if you're really, really in a bind, I guess you could buy them just for the convenience factor. That or, you know, you could just buy some fucking pre made flans at the store. They're pretty easy to, to keep and they last a long time while they're refrigerated. Honestly, best of all, most of these refrigerator flans, you can get them in like, like multi packs at Latino markets and they're made with real eggs and milk and everything. These are those aforementioned convenience store flans that I mentioned earlier that are also really big in Japan. Or if you're really lucky, you can just get fresh flan from a restaurant or bakery. Shout out to La Familia Bakery. They have delicious flan and make awesome wedding cakes. Yeah,、uh, hell, one of the reasons flan originally caught on so much in Spain and other areas was because restaurants could just make mass quantities of them and store it for long periods of time for customers in the refrigerator. It's a lot easier than just making the stuff per order on a daily basis. If you can make something tasty like flan in bulk, why not do it? Speaking of making in bulk, let's finally go back to Japan real quick. As mentioned, you can find flan there at pretty much any supermarket, any convenience store, or any dessert shop in glorious Nihon. Over there, though, they call it pudin, which is a kind of confusing since the English, so like Romaji translation spelling of it, makes it look like it says purin. But if you use like actual Japanese pronunciation and accent, it kind of just comes out sounding like the word pudding. Pudin, pudding, pudding, pudding. Eh. I guess it's close enough. As I said, though, dairy isn't really that well loved in Asia the way it is in Europe and other parts of the world, especially Japan. Hell, it's to the point that the Japanese actually even invented a, a cute little derogatory remark for European travelers who are visiting Japan, bata kusai, which basically just translates to butter stinkers. Basically, they, they believe that European people had like, really strong body odor compared to Japanese people, and they blamed it on their diets, which were rich in milk and cream and eggs. And when I say they came up with that knock on Europeans for being too smelly, I'm not saying this was like 700, 800 years ago. I mean, this is something that got invented in like, the last like, 100, 200 years or something. And apparently, they like, still throw that term around like, when they talk shit about Westerners to this very day sometimes. I mean, can we really hold that against them considering everything the West has done to them? Like, I don't know. It's refreshing to be reminded that everyone's a little racist. Not just white people. But really, the Japanese are good sports. They put up with a lot. Flan, or as I mentioned, called pudding, is frequently eaten as a sort of fun, like, kitty kind of food in Japan. It's very frequently featured in those cute little DIY candy making kits that are huge now, where. They just give you a bunch of packets of ingredients and mixes, and you add water and you mold them into these little trays and make your own little candy things at home. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go check them out. They're actually really fun.、Uh, I think like, one popular brand is called Crazy with a K, K R A C I E. Go, go look them up. They're really cute. You make little tiny mini desserts that you get to eat. Yeah, just don't start at one in the morning. Like, don't make the same mistake we did the first time. Or you'll be falling asleep waiting for your jelly tamagoyaki to set. Yeah, anyway, they're, they're really neat. Honestly, I'm surprised that they're catching on in the United States here, though, considering you end up spending like 45 minutes of your time to create this little jelly thing or a tiny cookie that you pop in your mouth and you eat in one bite. I always figured Americans would be too fucking lazy for that, but hey,、uh, I guess I'd love to be proven wrong. Anyway, a few years back, the Japanese confection company g l e e c o introduced the mother of all flans. Lord have mercy, the almighty, the fearsome, the giga pudding. Actually, not.、Nah, it was marketed the way you would expect Japan to market literally any product. With a bunch of cute little chibi characters dancing around your TV screen, singing an adorable little song. By the way, if you want an irritating song stuck in your head for the next four and a half hours, Look up Giga Pudding commercials. You won't regret it. Well, until you go insane from singing the song over and over again in your head. 
But yeah, basically Giga Pudding is one of those aforementioned flan powder mixes that you just add milk or water to. The thing that sets it apart though from all the crappy ones you can get from like the, the dry mix aisle is that this thing is in the fucking size of a bucket. Seriously, it's like two gallons. When you pop it out, it's bigger than your head. I don't know if you're supposed to eat it as a croup or just nom the whole thing down into your fat face with no remorse. Ah, how American of them though. I kind of want to try it just for the novelty factor. I know it wouldn't hold the candle to real fun. Come on, when's the next time you can get a dessert that's bigger than your face? Fun facts time, Jigglypuff is named Pudding in Japan. It's nicknamed the balloon Pokemon here in English, so I guess it's supposed to be bouncy and rubbery, kind of like Flan, but it has the name inspiration for Flan, also known as Pudding, as I mentioned. And of course, as we all know, Jigglypuff is a Pokemon, in case you've spent the last two decades living under a rock located beneath an even larger rock. And uh, if, if you don't know what a Pokemon is, then, well, we'll pray for you. Seriously, could they even be listening to a podcast at that point? I don't think it's possible to know what a podcast is, but not Pokemon. Uh, someone write in and prove us wrong. Will they be able to email us or will it be a letter in the mail? There goes that idea. <laughs> oh, well. Honestly, you know, with Jigglypuff and, and its, its Japanese name, Pudding, it's honestly kind of a shame they didn't work flan into Jigglypuff's design, like its artistic, like, appearance design a bit more. Because, like, even the English name sounds kind of desserty, like, Jigglypuff. Like, it sounds like a pastry of some sort, but, like, I don't know. It's just, like, this weird balloon rabbit thing that kind of looks like it's permanently hopped up on amphetamines. Actually, while we're ham-fisting a discussion about Pokemon into this food podcast, I gotta come out and say, for the longest fucking time as a kid, I thought the evolved form of Jigglypuff, Wigglytuff, I thought his name was Wiggly Stuff when I was a kid. It made me really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's just some Wiggly Stuff. It's so uncomfortable about that. Uh, well... <laughs> This this podcast already had a lot of innuendo undoing, so why not more? Well, either way, we've we've properly demonstrated Japan's fascination with flan, so see, I guess the comparison to anime boobs wasn't so far off after all. They do seem to really, really like bouncy things. Actually, on that note, additional, more innuendo sexual fun fact, in the past few games in the Dead or Alive series, the developers actually bragged about how they created brand new proprietary physics engines programmed to the game, exclusively to control the female character's boobs independent of the rest of the models it was like serious fucking business they were like bragging about it and like showing off like demonstrations of it japan's a weird place when did we get so far away from flan yeah my bad you're right this episode took a, lot, a really weird left at albuquerque let's finish up with a flan recipe before it gets even more r-rated than it already is so this one is a pretty run-of-the-mill recipe, and it comes to us from Isabel Eats, a delightful food website that I found, which uh, it has a lot of really cool Mexican-inspired recipes on it, presumably run by a chick named Isabel. Ooh, is it Isabel from Animal Crossing? Mmm, I just saw like a, a peppy-looking Latino girl on the website, so unfortunately it seems like a no. Oh. Anyway... This recipe calls for three quarters of a cup of granulated sugar, four large eggs, one 14 ounce can of sweet, con sweetened condensed milk, one and a quarter cup of whole milk, and one tablespoon of vanilla extract. Like we said a bunch of times in this episode, flan is a really uncomplicated dessert. It's supposed to be simple. It ain't fancy, it ain't hard to make, it's just a simple pleasure. Most recipes, like the most flan recipes you find, they're actually really similar, if not exactly the same, because, well, there's not much you could do to change flan. For starters, preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Place a 7 inch round cake pan inside the oven and let it heat up. On your stove, you're going to place the sugar into a saucepan and you slowly melt it on medium heat. You want it to caramelize, but you don't want it to burn. So keep stirring it, because sugar goes from brown and beautiful to charcoal disaster pretty friggin' quickly. Once it's turned into that classic caramel color, pour it out into your heated up cake pan. Obviously that pan is going to be hot, so use some pot holders to tilt it around so you evenly cover the bottom of the pan with the caramel sauce. After that, in a separate bowl, you combine the eggs, the milk, and the vanilla, and you beat it until it's nice and smooth. Pour your custard mixture into the pan after the caramel is hardened, Stick it into a larger baking dish and fill that baking dish with water so that it comes up about halfway to the top of the custard pan and cover the top with aluminum foil. 
One of the things I found while researching flan recipes is there actually is a special type of flan pan, or if you want to be a uh, New York, it's like a flan pan. Uh, but yeah, I think it's called a flanella, but it basically looks like a, like a cheesecake spring form pan with a little like cover that goes over it. That's supposed to like steam the flan perfectly, but I assume most of you don't have that. So just go with aluminum foil. Anyway, once you have it covered, stick that with the pan in it into the oven and bake for about an hour at 350 degrees. After the hour is up, use the old toothpick trick that you test for doneness. You want the flan to be firm, but you want it to still be jiggly. You don't want it to be dry and well cooked like a cake is, but you also don't want it to be runny and raw on the inside. If it looks done and the toothpick comes out clean, it's probably done. If not, you just bake it for another five minutes and try again. Repeat that until it's ready to come out. After this, all it's left to do is refrigerate the flan and let it get nice and cold. After that, you just slip it out onto a platter and it's ready to serve. See, we told you flan was simple. I mean, of course, you could dress it up and add all sorts of wacky, cool flavors to make it even better. Hell, this restaurant, Gaio, here in Patchogue, the owner, Dave, has a top-secret flan recipe that they serve there. Not tres leches, not cuatro leches. It's a cinco leches flan. Five milks. I don't know what the hell the five milks are. I remember when we would go there, my mother would, like, get into, like, a fucking philosophical debate with him, like guessing every time with the owner trying to like figure out what it is but like as far as i know she's never guessed it or i don't know i guess he could have been lying to her to like protect it but uh, he seems like a nice guy so probably not uh okay so let's see five leches well there's milk uh condensed milk probably coconut milk could be in there um the hell else is left breast milk the boob connections never end Anyway, like I said, there's also chocolate flan, coffee flan, chai spice flan, add whatever the hell you want it to suit your taste. Just whatever you do, don't add fucking fish sauce. Oh boy, that about covers it for today's main course. I hope you guys saved room, as always, for some podcast dessert in this dessert podcast. <laughs> in the spirit of flan's gelatinous nature... This week for dessert, we're doing a spin-off segment of shitty old recipes called Jello Nightmares. For some reason, in the days of yore, I would say probably post-World War II till the 80s, people just love putting things in gelatin that were never meant to be put in jello. So today we're going to take a look at some of these monstrosities. This week, the recipes we're looking at come courtesy of my mom's college roommate and a book called Knox on Camera Recipes, which has a copyright from 1963. If you're not familiar, Knox is, like, one of the main gelatin maker brands. Yeah, they were, like, filming these in a, I guess, like, an early, like, Food Network-style, like, cooking show or something or other. But I guess they uh, they, they go on about explaining on-camera recipes, I guess, because it was on novelty back then. It just seems weird to be, like... What we did here was we had a person make a recipe and then we filmed them making the recipe and told you all about it. Like, did that really need explaining back then? People knew what television was, so was that hard to put together that someone cooked it on TV and then they just, like, took stills of that and put it into the book? I don't know. Maybe I'm being too future here. Maybe. I will say, the first section of the book, On Camera Salads, isn't the worst like there's jellied gazpacho which sounds not the greatest but then there's like fruit nectar salad which like that sounds fine grapefruit ginger salad that sounds pretty good um and then like the end section of desserts that's where it's at those all sound pretty good yeah there's there's one thing they have that i actually really want to try because it basically just looks like a fucking chocolate sand castle it's like a big old like it's like a foot tall like chocolate jello mold thing and it looks all like it, it looks like solid pudding almost i bet you that thing might give the fucking giga pudding a run for its money might but yeah the real uh the real horrors come into play in the middle section of on camera main dishes and um you might have to try and scan some of these to include on this post so you can get the visual but even just on the main opening page there's one of there's like I'm assuming people have seen the, like, fish-shaped jello mold. So, like, there's one of those, but, like, I don't even know what it's filled with because it's, like, 
white it's not clear like jello so presumably it's some kind of mushed up animal <laughs> that used to be an animal and is now a food in jello yeah <laughs> i i think they a lot of the recipes called for like canned meat and stuff and just told you to like process it or puree it or chop it <laughs> like as if canned meat couldn't get any grosser they were like Yo, what if we take that like shitty old meat that's in, that's been in a can? What what could we do to make that even worse? Yo, what if we like blend it up into like a, a fucking slurry and then like stick it into a Jello mold? Bam, there we go. Yeah, there's a lot of recipes that call for a can of tuna, at, that then also gets mixed with milk and gelatin. Oh fuck. Like to be fair. They all call for unflavored gelatin. It's not like you're mixing it with strawberry banana jello. But that still doesn't make it right. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anything will ever make the term chicken mousse jello mold sound right. Remember how in our first episode we were shitting on corned beef and cabbage? Oh yeah, I do. And I will never stop shitting on corned beef and cabbage because I think it's a fucking disgusting meme food that no one actually likes. What if I told you you could have it in Jello? Oh boy! There's they, they just hear like, oh, you know what? I bet Eric. Uh, I bet they really like fucking corned beef and cabbage. So uh, let's 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 make it even worse. How can we make it worse? Oh, bam! Jello mold. Yeah, you know, there's the shredded cabbage layer, oh. which is in gelatin, and then there's the corned beef layer, which is also in gelatin, and it's just a nice little layered food that looks awful i don't understand the rational for like for making all these jet like why why were people so up jello's ass for like 50 years or it's like i don't know i feel like this is something i should have learned about in school when i was getting my master's in like pop culture and shit like what but, like what, i didn't what benefits are there like Let's take food that could just be regular good food and we're going to stick it into a fucking gel so that you can't actually get to the food. You have to slice it apart like a cake. Like one of those recipes in there, I think there was like a Thanksgiving one or like a turkey Thanksgiving like thing with like cranberry layers and turkey. Oh, yeah, like, there's molded turkey and cranberry. Who, who in their fucking right mind is like, okay, you could have this plate of turkey, mashed potatoes, and green beans, and, and, and fucking, like, Brussels sprouts, and, and gravy, mashed potatoes, like, you could have that on a plate. Or, what if we suspended it into a fucking ring shape, and then you have to slice it apart and eat it like it's a fucking cake? Why? Honestly, it was probably, like, they were probably just using all the leftover aluminum from World War II, and making all the funky jello molds, yeah. and being like, how can we get people to actually use these? Instead of advertising them as cake pans for some reason. How do we trick like, people into eating this shit? Yeah. They're like, no, we gotta put some uh we gotta put some jellied veal loaf in this cow shaped oh, jello mold. There's also like the one that like the molded macaroni and cheese hurts my heart. <laughs> because macaroni and cheese is such a good, like, comfort food. It has no need to be put into gelatin. Like, it, it just doesn't. Honestly, with fucking... People make, like, deep-fried mac and cheese. And if you put mac and cheese into a container, into a mold in the refrigerator, it holds its shape. It, it, does. it doesn't need to be in a fucking jello mold. People, it really doesn't. They cut it apart and they fry it because it just sticks together. Because you know what else can congeal like gelatin does? Except it has a fucking flavor. Uh, cheese. Except cheese actually makes sense to go into certain savory dishes. It even calls for one and a half cups of cooked broken macaroni, which just what? speaks to, like, everyone's broken dreams. What? Why broken macaroni specifically? They just, they I knew what know. they were creating. They were like, yeah, the, this this dish needs, the ingredients need to reflect on the fucking sadness of what their people are actually cooking when they make this. And it calls for grated American cheese, which, like, even if you're not using Kraft Singles, American cheese is one of the softest cheeses on the planet. How do you grate that without it just fall? Like, how? Uh, ignoring the fact of how you grate such a soft cheese, where the fuck do you even just get a block of American cheese from? The 1950s? Yeah, apparently a time machine, I guess. Because, I don't know, like, you can get, like, you know, I know 
American cheese isn't like the best cheese, but like if you want it, if it's your jam and you want to get like slices of it, like you don't have to get shitty craft singles, which is disgusting. Like you can go to the deli and you get like nice quality, like boar's head, like sliced American cheese. that's like fresh and it's actually like tastes like a cheese. But like, I guess maybe you could like walk into the deli back then and just like, Hey there, Bruce, uh, uh, give me, uh, give me, give me a block of American cheese. Like, and just fucking take it home and grate it up and slice it yourself. What a fucking weird time period. Yeah, it's weird times. It's a shame, too, because some of the recipes, like, sound pretty, like, chicken and pineapple salad. That sounds yummy, but then it's, like, suspended in gelatin for some reason. Yeah, why? Why should your food be, like, a fucking treasure hunt? Why should you have to excavate it and dig it out of a a fucking old liquefied bone gel and cartilage gel? (laughs) Gross. Mm. You know, honestly, like, now that I'm thinking about it, how the fuck did jello molds and shit not catch on in Japan? That's a good question. We spent a third of this podcast talking <laughs> about how Japan loves fucking jiggly things and they love anime titties and fucking boobs and flan and pudding and like something we didn't even go over is like a lot of Japanese desserts are like jiggly jelly consistency. They use that agar agar powder that we mentioned before, the red algae shit. And they make, like, gummies. They make these things called, like, uh, I think they're called, like, raindrop cakes. And it kind of looks like a jello, like a jello mold, but not like a mold. It just looks a little, like, like a big, uh, I don't want to keep bringing up boobs, but, like, it looks like a uh, a boob implant. (laughs) It just looks like a little clear baggie. And they put, like, I don't know, they put, like, sugar in it or they add, like, little, like, treats inside. And you could eat it. They, like, all their desserts are centered around, like, mochi is, like, pounded up rice paste, and it gets this gummy texture. How the fuck did, did someone not just, you know what? No, I know why. It's they, I don't know. Like, America was still mad at Japan because they were still just, like, really super racist and, like, probably, like, I don't know. That's probably a big part of it. And Japan was probably a little bummed out by the, you know, nuking them. <laughs> so, yeah, they had other things to do than make weird... Like they just stick pineapple and chicken into the bottom of a fucking mold with jello on top of it. Yeah, they had bigger concerns. Ugh, gross. Maybe we'll take a look at this uh, this book again if we want some fucking some additional abominations <laughs> in this podcast. But I guess with that, peeps, we're all set here. Check, please. <laughs> Well, that about wraps it up for this week's edition of Poor Couples Food Guide Deep Dish. Remember, we are in fact the only podcast left where you're more likely to learn about cereal than cereal killers. Search recipes, cooking tips, and other cool stuff on our website, poorcouplesfoodguide.com. And don't forget, you can always write in to us at poorcouplesfoodguide at gmail.com to ask for any food advice that you may need. You can also just send in any comments, feedback, criticism, hate mail, love mail, chain letters, postcards, and whatever random pondering should pass your mind. Once again, that's poorcouplesfoodguide at gmail.com. Or if you like, you can hit us up on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and all other social media accounts known to mankind. Actually, on that note, this brings an end to our initial five-episode trial run that we've been doing We said at the beginning, Deep Dish is kind of like an experimental thing, so, you know, at this point, this wraps up our our first little experiment of five episodes, and I don't know, we'll see where we go from here. We would really appreciate feedback and, you know, constructive criticism that anyone might have, because Lord knows there's a fucking billion podcasts out there, so the last thing the world needs is another one. But if there's something we could do to make this one better, or to make it stand out to you, then feel free to let us know. We'll be glad to take your advice. Yeah, like, let us know, like, what segments you like, what you don't like. Do you like more of the history? Do you like more of the modern day? Which of the dessert segments is your favorite? Do you want more fun facts about anime titties? We could do that for you. I could find a way to ham fist that into every episode if that's what you really want. Actually, more importantly, let us know you didn't like, because we don't want to keep doing stuff no one likes. (laughs) We're going to keep working on this, and, uh... We'll see. We, we've got some more plans for it, so keep your eyes peeled on social media, and we'll be sure to announce something soon about any future episodes. Until then, everybody, we bid you a good day, we bid you good eats, and we say stay hungry and keep feeding that brain. And tummy.
age-old question though: cookies or ice cream? Fuck. <laughs> 